Part 3. Psychotherapeutics, or Practical Mental Cure It is the spirit that makes us alive. The flesh provides nothing. Jesus the Christ, as the state of the mind is capable of producing a disease, another state of it may affect a cure. John Hunter, Chapter 1. On the Method of Communicating a Sanative Mental Influence All the mental operations are reducible to thought and feeling, or, if you prefer the form of expression, to intellect and sensibility. All modifications of the mind refer themselves to one or the other. All existence, all life, in fact, the very essence of the soul, consists in either thought or feeling. Some, of whom M. Destut Tracy, a follower of Condillac, is an example, make feeling to be identical with individual existence. He is a fair representative of the sensational school of philosophy, and in him it received its best logical expression. He says, the faculty of feeling is that which manifests to us all the others, without which none of them would exist for us, whilst it manifests itself that it is its own principle to itself, that it is that beyond which we are not able to remount, and which constitutes our existence, that it is everything for us, that it is the same thing as ourselves. I feel because I feel, I feel because I exist, and I do not exist but because I feel. Then my existence and my sensibility are one and the same thing. The idealists, as Fichte and Hegel, affirm that sensation is not possible except it be accompanied and preceded by thought, that whatever is out of thought has no existence in feeling. Swedenborg makes the essence of the human soul to consist in the union of thought and feeling, or, as Hope puts it, the conjunction of the wisdom and the love. The question which is prior and which is posterior, or which is cause and which is effect, I shall not hero discuss. It will he my aim to show that both, as states of mind, are communicable to other minds for the modification of their spiritual and physical condition. In this the cure of disease consists. It has been shown in the preceding chapters that thoughts are things. I do not mean by this that they are material, but substantial realities, and are that which gives reality and existence to everything else. Thoughts and ideas are not as they are usually supposed, mere shadows or abstractions, but are manifestations or modifications of the substance of the soul, and are more real than material things, for these have no properties that are not reducible to sensations and thoughts in our minds. Thoughts are the most substantial of realities, and are in fact the only real things in the universe, but they are transmissible entities. They can be transferred from one mind to another. This fact is put to a practical use in the pulpit and in all our systems of education. In it is found the power of the press in modern civilization. In it also I shall show lies the power of the physician to an extent never recognized by the prevailing schools of medicine. If thought and existence are identical, as has been shown in the previous chapters of this volume, then it follows that to change our mode of thinking is to modify our existence. Thoughts may be excited in the minds of others through the medium of words. This is by an external way, and is comparatively imperfect, for words have not exactly the same meaning to any two minds. This common mode of communication, which is adopted in our ordinary social life, is of no use unless there previously exists in the mind which you address an idea corresponding to the word you utter. Words can only excite latent thoughts in another soul, and never originate them. If you speak in an unknown tongue, you excite only a sensation of sound which has no meaning. A person may talk to us all day in a language which we do not understand and give us no idea. The same may be said of written language, which is addressed to the eye instead of the ear. In the case of words, as a medium of communicating thought to the mind of another, it is through the principle of sensation, either that of hearing or sight, that the ideas they represent are excited. Yet words have a spiritual potency in them when addressed to one who understands them, or can he made to feel their meaning as we do. Then his soul, his inner being, is made to vibrate, as it were, in harmony with ours. But words, either spoken or written, are not absolutely necessary to the communication of thought from one mind to another. There is a more direct and spiritual way in which it may be done, even through sensation. You ask me a question, and I answer it in the affirmative by a nod, and in the negative by a shake of the head, and you perfectly understand me, though no words are used. So does a child, for the recognition of the meaning is instinctive and intuitional. 
But cannot this be done through the sense of touch as well as through the sight or hearing? This sense is the most spiritual and interior of all our senses. It is that to which all the others are reducible and underlies them all. Without it, no sensation would be possible. This is a doctrine of Swedenborg psychology and is manifestly true. There is a tendency in the minds of two persons who are in tactual contact towards a oneness of thought and feeling. This takes place through a universal principle of human nature denominated psychometry, but which I prefer to call the sympathetic sense. If I wish the person sitting or standing next to me to move away, a slight push of the hand excites in him both the thought and the impulse to do so. It calls into action in him all the muscles concerned in the movement. This is, when carefully examined, a marvelous phenomenon. It is only because it is so common that we cease to wonder at it. I communicate to him by my touch a thought of a complicated muscular movement and a tendency toward it. But is it out of the range of possibility to affect, by the same hand, the natural action of other organs, as the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, the stomach, the liver, or the peristaltic action of the bowels? There is no good reason why an impulse cannot be transmitted on the wings of an invisible thought as a messenger to those organs. It is in itself no more unreasonable than that your feeling of approval is communicable to another by a pat of the hand on his shoulder, or a feeling of disapproval by a blow proportioned in force to the degree of your displeasure. A pressure of the hand signifies friendship. It has that meaning to everybody. There is a sort of instinctive masonry by which our thoughts and feelings are communicated to others by the touch, and which all souls understand. I use these only as examples or illustrations of the transference of thought and feeling from one mind to another through the medium of the hand and the sensation of touch. When the hand is placed on the head of a patient, at the point of impact your mind comes into contact, as it were, with his mind, for sensation is not in the external body, but in the spiritual organism. If he is receptive or in any degree impressible, your thoughts and healthy emotional states can be transmitted to him, or more properly excited in him, as they do not pass out of your mind in coming into his. An impulse towards a healthy action may in this way be imparted to any organ of his body. This has been established by experiment. Here is the philosophy of the method of cure by the imposition of hands, which, as the primitive, instinctive means of cure, is again being restored to the healing art. It was practiced by Jesus the Christ and his disciples or scholars, which ought to be enough to give it currency among those who assume his name and profess to copy his life. The hand was used in order that through the sensation of touch, which is only in the mind of the patient, your thought, to which is given a healing intention, may be communicated to his soul, and through this affect the body. In this condition of mental contact with him, the physician thinks, imagines, and believes for the patient, and if he is highly susceptible his mind will vibrate in harmony with yours. If not fully impressible, it will create a tendency towards your line of thought and feeling. It is like what we witness in the material world when a body in motion communicates its movement to another body, and both move onward in the same direction. There is a still more interior way of communication between the mind or spirit of one and the mind or spirit of another by which thought may be transmitted and an influence imparted. No actual physical contact is necessary to it. The eye is an organ of thought in an eminent degree. Everyone knows there is a meaning in a look, a hidden signification in a glance, as much as in a word. Vision may be a passive state or a voluntary act. The same is true of hearing, which is often without effort on our part. But to listen or hearken is an act of will. It requires attention or a concentration of thought. To gaze at another is an act of will and a determination of thought towards the object. It gives a definite direction to thought and brings the whole power of the mind to a focal point. The thought, to use an analogy, or to speak according to appearance, goes forth from the eye and enters the mind of the patient through this aperture of the soul. There is such a thing as a spiritual eye or eye of the mind as Mr. Atkinson denominates it. As a phrenologist, he locates it just beneath the organ of comparison. It seems, he says, to split off into the senses, as light divides off into colors, or sound into notes, but to contain within itself the power of mind concentrated. This cogitative gaze, this look with fixed attention and concentration of thought, 
was employed by Peter and John in the cure of the lame man at the gate of the temple. In the brief report that is given of the case it is said, they fastened their eyes upon him and said to him, Look on us, and then commanded him to rise and walk. With the word was communicated a power to do it, for a thought imparted to another may be made to enclose a feeling. It may be, as it were, the outward wrapping of an emotion or impulse. Also this same power of mind concentrated, this cogitative gaze, may be made to act at a distance. And why not? Is there anything incredible in it? If the sound of an uttered word, or a sentence, may be transmitted on an electric wave for hundreds of miles through the telephone, why may not a mental force, which acts independently of material restraints and limitations, be conveyed to any distance? Distance between minds is more an internal feeling than a material measurement. Thought may be direct impressed by one mind upon that of another. As Paul and Swedenborg both teach, thought is entheal, that is, it comes from God and is something of the divine life in man. It is this that gives such power to our thoughts both over ourselves and others. It is this that makes them, to use an uncommon but proper word, entheastic, or having in them the energy of God. As has been said in a previous chapter, thought has in it a creative force. The words of Byron can hardly be viewed as a poetic exaggeration. The mind can make substance and people planets of its own with beings brighter than have been, and give a breath to forms that can outlive all flesh. By the productive power of thought and imagination the divine mind made, and still makes, the world. We, being in his image and thinking from him, make our bodies, which are our world, in the same way. A state of theopathy, or sympathy with God, invests us with the power of theurgy, or of doing divine works. Every true manhood might properly, though in a mitigated sense, be named Emmanuel, or God with us. The Greeks in their beautiful and expressive language spoke of certain persons as carrying a God within them, and also of others as having a divine mind, or as being divinely wise. This is more or less true of all great and wise men. But when we speak of God as within man, we must be careful not to take a material view of it. We do not mean the same as when we say that one body is enclosed within the spatial limitations of another, like an idol in a temple. That God is inward to man involves the idea that God's life is the one life of the universe, and that our life is bound up in a necessary unity with His. There is in reality no finite life, as all in heaven and earth live by an influx from the universal life. For the same reason, there is no finite intelligence and thought. All that I know, or can know, or even think, is from the uncreated fount of knowledge, and I am only a recipient of it. To think in harmony and concert with God is to fully realize this when we think. This brings our thought into unison with the action of the divine mind, and gives to it a divine and saving efficacy. When a patient is in a passive, and consequently impressible and receptive, state, and with his eyes closed, so as to shut out from his mind all sensational images of external things, our thoughts may be imparted to him, or at least we can change the character and direction of his thinking. This can be done either when in actual tactual contact with him or at a distance. In addition to a state of passivity, he should be in a state of sympathy with the physician. These conditions being fulfilled, his mind becomes a tabula rasa or clean slate on which our thoughts may be written and even without the intervention of spoken words. What we imagine and believe and think will be transferred to him, for the stronger and more active mind will control the other. Thought is an interior speech, or inward word. It is the proper language of souls, the universal language of spirit. As God's thoughts can be imparted to us by inspiration, so we can impress our ideas and feelings upon the minds of others and inspire them with them. The physician who does this to the invalid and infuses into him his faith and hope and courage, or, in other words, a better mode of thinking and feeling, has touched the interior spring of his existence, and is, in the true sense of the word, a doctor or teacher. It was in this office that Jesus the Christ cured the most inveterate diseases. He was a guide of men's thoughts, an instructor of their souls. In the Gospels, wherever he is called master in our English translation, in the original Greek it is teacher. Hence, his followers were called disciples or learners. By thus modifying the inward spring of existence, he changed the position of the helm of the soul and put it on a new tack in the voyage of life.
and by a divine law, the inner change was translated into a bodily expression. If it be true, as Swedenborg affirms, that all power is in ultimates, because the spiritual force is then in its completeness and fullness, then it follows that thoughts, expressed in their appropriate words, may have an added potency, and their effects may be made thereby more permanent. But it should never be forgotten that the spiritual idea, which is as the soul of the word, is that alone which gives to it a healing and saving efficacy. Without this, an uttered word or sentence is only an empty sound. It is only a frozen corpse, and not a living spirit in whom is the breath of a divine life. It is the idea, the thought, that imparts to a word a sanative virtue. It is the spirit that mocketh alive. The flesh provideth nothing. The words that I speak unto you are spirit and are life. Farbach eloquently speaks of the healing power of the word. Man has not only an instinct, an internal necessity, which impels him to think, to perceive, to imagine. He has also the impulse to speak, to utter, to impart his thoughts. A divine impulse this, a divine power, the power of words. The word is the imaged, revealed, radiating, lustrous, enlightening thought. The word is life and truth. All power is given to the Word. The Word makes the blind to see and the lame to walk, heals the sick, and brings the dead to life. The Word works miracles, and the only rational miracles. The Word is the Gospel, the paraclete of mankind. The Word has power to redeem, to reconcile, to bless, to make free. We know no higher spiritually operative power and expression of power than the power of the Word. God created the world and all things by the word, so that to God it is no more difficult to create than it is for us to name. A word, an uttered sentence, into which is concentrated the soul life and heart life of him who pronounces it, and which is animated by a divine thought, a living truth, has in it a healing virtue above anything in a material drug. The right word at the right time can reach the inner life of man and make us whole. It can change the whole current and quality of a human life. He sent his word and healed them, and delivered them from their destructions. He who has to do with the diseased in mind or body need not talk much, but should pray for the right word, and should put the energy of faith and love into its expression. It is more powerful against our spiritual foes than the spear of Ithuriel. There is some word that lies as a silent thought in the mind of God, the infinite spirit presence. It is what God would say to the unhappy and diseased one were he to break the sublime silence in which he dwells and speak to him. And it is a message freighted with life and health and peace. Let us hold our soul passively open and upward to receive it and give it utterance. It has in it the power of God and the wisdom of God unto salvation. Many a longing soul is feeling, if not saying, Speak the word only, and I shall be healed. It was by the power of the right word and the spirit that Jesus healed disease. He condensed into a brief sentence the whole force of his inner life, his faith, his love, his benevolent healing intention, his desire and volition, which was sent forth as an assertion or a command. It was like the creative fiat let there be light, and the living, all vitalizing light of the heavens flashed upon the diseased mind. It reduced its chaos to order and divine harmony and a body in ruins was restored to wholeness and health. We ought to ascertain, so far as practicable, the precise nature of the disordered mental state, or fixed mode of thought, that is the spiritual root of. The patient's malady, and which has crystallized, through the law of correspondence, into an organic expression in the body. This should be attacked by the psychotherapeutic force from every point of approach. The patient should himself freely aid in the spiritual diagnosis of his case. The Roman Catholic Church maintains the divine order when it makes confession a necessary antecedent of absolution or a being released. The sin, the error, the falsity, as the word means, should be remitted or sent away in order to this he should he like clay in the hands of the potter, to be transformed by the divinely established dominion of mind over matter and of the soul over the body. In a state of passivity, or mental inertia, the mind acts only as it is acted upon. This state can be assumed at will, and is one of great impressibility or susceptibility to impression from the thoughts and emotions of others, as a vessel without a helm is driven before the wind. 
In assuming this condition before the good physician, the patient becomes like a ship that has lowered its sails and is being towed by a steamer into a safe harbor. The secret of the influence of what is called magnetism is the influence of the thought and will of the operator over the mind, and through the mind, over the body of another. When the patient is passive and, consequently, impressible, he is made to fix his thought with expectant attention upon the effect to be produced. In addition, the physician thinks the same effect, tranquilly and strongly wills it, and believes and imagines that it is being done. The mental action of the patient, augmented by that of his assistant, and conjoined with it into a harmonious and sympathetic unity, is precipitated upon the body and becomes a silent, transforming, sanative energy. It must be a malady more than ordinarily obstinate that is neither relieved nor cured by it. The power of thought in modifying the bodily condition and affecting the functional action of an organ may be shown by a single fact. Although it is well known, says Dr. Tuke, that powerful emotions act strongly upon the uterine functions, it is not so well understood how marked an influence an ideational faculty, in the form of concentrated attention, exerts over them. A striking case is reported by Mr. Braid which illustrates this fact very clearly. The effect took place, moreover, in a state of the system not rendered susceptible at the time by his special method, that of hypnotism. He had, on a previous occasion, relieved a state of amenorrhea by a mixed method, partly hypnotic and partly mental, but it then occurred to him that, inasmuch as he attributed his success in her case entirely to fixed mental attraction with the predominant idea and faith in the result, he might succeed by the psychical process alone, without sending her to sleep, in fact, while she was wide awake. He tried the experiment, addressing her thus. Now, keep your mind firmly fixed on what you know should happen. In the meanwhile, he allowed his own will to be passive and read a book. At the expiration of eleven minutes, the experiment ended, and the desired result took place within that period. The same treatment was adopted when required on subsequent occasions, and with the same success. This case speaks volumes of the power of attention, or concentrated thought, combined with faith and imagination over every organ of the body.